saw a great thing on Facebook today, by the way. It's like, you know, you post it and you get your friends' comments of if they saw you in handcuffs in the back of a police car, what would they think that you had done to deserve that? And I got some really nice comments on mine. One person said I probably just like wandered into a private section of a museum, you know, the, the no trespassing section of a museum. And that was good. My own comment was that maybe I was shoplifting some little Chet's chicken. I don't know, <laughs> from the convenience store, that that would be a possibility. But my absolute favorite is one of my friends said I would be arrested for impersonating ZZ Top. So <laughs> I kind of like that. I kind of like that. I, you know how you write LOL? I actually LOL'd on that one. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> That's a good question, though. The same friend that said in per saying ZZ Top, I said that they would be arrested for money laundering, that they would have left their wallet in their pocket before they did the laundry, so they'd be arrested for money laundering. Oh, I thought it was funny. Come on. <laughs> I went down a list of crimes, so I found what I thought I could make a joke about. Maybe I should have looked a little bit further, apparently. All right, we're going to talk about forms today, and we're going to talk about um, we have three more like areas to talk about forms. Um, last time was sort of the, the, the setting the ground to understand like the purpose of this and sort of the mechanics of how it works. Um, so it's sort of a mix of the higher level concepts and the, 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 the coding um, of how what you put on your web page makes it to the web server, and then the web server can do something with it. And again, um, we don't cover the web server in this class, but uh, or, or the, the server side code in this class, but we are going to cover how to create the HTML form. So there's sort of that basic stuff that we went over last time. We'll take a look at that for a second. In addition to that, the stuff that we're going to cover today includes Number one, different form controls. In other words, we'll talk about why everything is in a text box. Number two, we may touch on, and I might come back to this, depending on the order that we go in, but new HTML five form controls because that was one of the one of the uh, good features of HTML five is they they created some um, additional web controls in previous versions of HTML five a text box was just a text box you put anything in there whereas they've refined and sort of created different flavors of the text box like if you're going to put a date in it or if you're going to put a email address or whatever. So we may look at those. We may save those for next week. Third thing we're going to talk about is styling the form. Now we might get, and again, we'll do some of these sort of simultaneously. And last but not least, we're going to talk about accessibility in forms. All right. So we'll, this isn't necessarily a linear thing. We'll probably, as we're talking about one thing, we'll, we'll slide into other areas and all that, but that's, that's sort of an overview of, of where we're going with forms today. All right, last time we talked about, you know, probably like the two most basic fundamental form controls. That is a text box, which just allows you to put in a single line of text, all right, and then the submit button, and the submit button being what actually sends that form data to the server for the server to do something with it. Now, that something depends entirely on, uh, on the situation, right? In the case of Google, that something would be to go and run, do your search, and display the results back. In the case of, say, eBay, that something would be to take your bid and apply it to the item and save it in their database so that it's there, you know, um, it's there to be processed. For Angel, it might represent logging you on, so validating your credentials when you type in your username and password. Um, other parts of Angel, it might involve uploading an assignment to a Dropbox. All those things are sort of the things that the server-side scripts do 
with the form data that you supply them. All right. Now, again, the text box is probably the most fundamental, basic, free form. You can put anything you want. There's no way with a text box to limit it to just be numbers other than JavaScript. And again, I'm speaking the old-fashioned pre-HTML5 um, text box. It was a text box. All right. You can limit the number of characters you put in the text box. All right. So, for example, let's pull up the one that we did last time. We could do that by saying the size attribute. I stand corrected. That doesn't do it. That is actually the physical size. I never remember this. Look it up every single time. I thought I did it, but I didn't. Max length. We'll try that one. There we go. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. As much as I type now, it's not going any further than that. You can put a size attribute on it, but that is a physical size of the text box. That's not sort of a logical size of how much you can put in. Because that relates to the physical appearance of it, that would be better off done via CSS. But max length is really sort of a limit to the content, so I would put that in HTML. All right, doesn't matter how big I make it look, I only want to enter 10 characters. Now, why would you only allow someone to put in a certain number of characters. Like, why would I say only 10, up to 10 characters are allowed? For passwords? Okay, maybe. Usually, if anything, passwords are the opposite. They have to be at least so many characters. Um, but maybe. Why would I, well, uh, yeah, maybe. Is it Yeah. Uh, and again, even with passwords, probably the real reason that they limit that is because this is likely, this text box is likely to be somehow hooked up to a database. In other words, what we, what we type in there goes and gets put in some database. And if the database is defined to only accept 10 characters for the password, then you should limit them to only 10 characters. Um, or like first name, or last name, or whatever. All right. So that's one reason you'd control it, because on the other end, there's a database. Now, there's more stuff we can talk about when we get into JavaScript, uh, either in this class or if you take uh, CISS 232. But one of the big reasons for the stuff that we're going to talk about now is the fact that you're likely to take the data and put it in a database. And if you've had database class, you understand. If not, you can just take my word for it. With databases, there are constraints to the data. All right. For example, state. All right. You might, you could put state in a text box. But what's the problem with that, putting state in a text box? Allowing someone to enter the state in a text box. Yeah, you can misspell something. Even if you don't misspell it, you could use abbreviations. 
as opposed to writing out the full word. Like one person could put Ohio, another person could put OH. Someone could put in Michigan, someone could put MI, some someone could put MICH, and all that. So even if there isn't sort of a restriction on the side of the database, you would want to restrict it just to ensure consistency. In other words, if you allowed someone to freeform the data, you'd liable to get someone to type out putting the name in or use the abbreviation or use alternate abbreviations, in which case trying to get a report to see who all registered on your site from Michigan would, would not be very accurate. Exactly. What you would likely do would be to use a drop down. All right. And with a drop down, you can limit the selections that people make so that Again, if there's a constraint on the database side, or even if there isn't, just to ensure that you get a consistency of responses. You know, and you can think about that in, in any number of cases. Let's say we had a web page for learning community where we asked people what uh, sort of degrees they were interested in. There might be CISS or accounting or management or whatever. Well, if you could freeform type that in, someone's liable to type in something that you don't even really know what it means. Maybe they'll type in computers, right? And it's not really clear, do they mean, you know, um, yeah, uh, computer-aided uh, design, CAD, or, or networking, or software development, or web development, or whatever. So these other form controls ensure consistency. So let's run through the other form controls real quick, and then we'll add these to see the code. One is a drop down. And a drop down we've all seen looks like this. And it shows the value that you select in the text part of the drop down. And if you click on the little arrow, you see the whole list. And you can typically use your keys to navigate through it. All right. You can also type just the first letter of something, and it will automatically go to that. Now, you may say I've seen applications where I put in the first two letters it does it. That's typically done via JavaScript. The dropdown itself will do, you the, will do the first letter. That's just innate behavior of the dropdown. Dropdowns typically are used to only allow you to select one thing. But actually, depending on the properties that you set on the dropdown, you can actually select multiple things. I would generally suggest not to do that in a drop down just because most people are used to drop downs only selecting one item. All right. So we're talking about sending, you know, yes. Uh, to send information over by script. Right. Yes, yes. And it's all in my HTML. Instead of having, you know, the navigation be cumbersome, I have a drop down that's mm -hmm. And it's not going to any server. So, yeah. That, that, could, could you use more than that? Or is, it, is it something you can use? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to answer your question, yeah. You could use these forms even if they were not connected to server-side script. You could use the forms, for example, like and hook it to some JavaScript in your code, or you could use it just to show a list of items. Here's a list of all the things that we have. And, you know, so you could use it a variety of different ways. Absolutely. All right. So generally speaking, although you can allow multiple selections, we're going to consider drop-downs with just a single selection um, is permitted. Now, one interesting thing, and we'll see this as we as we go forward but the data gets sent to the server using the same mechanism regardless of the form control in other words we looked last time at the query string and saw how it said q equals something where it was what we had typed in to our text box it doesn't matter the form control the data on the query string is going to look 
in that format. In other words, if I use state and I selected Ohio, it would say state equals OH. There'd be no way, there's no way from the server side script to distinguish, hey, that was from a, uh, a drop down or that was from a checkbox or that was from whatever. Once it gets on the server side, it's just data. There's, there's no sense on the server side of, of the, the form control that was used to, to create it. Now what about defaults? What about defaults? How would you arrange the defaults in a dropdown? Yeah, you could arrange them alphabetically. Is there another way to arrange? I, of course there's other ways to arrange, but is there another reasonable or good way to arrange the data in a dropdown? Maybe by category? Maybe? Yeah, the one I'm thinking of more is most often selected. So for example, if I was doing a, a web page uh, for Lorain County Community College, you know, most of the students that attend Lorain Community College are from Lorain County. So if I had a drop down to select the county, I would likely put Lorain on top, even though maybe I would show all the state, all the counties in the state, but I'd put Lorain on the top, and I might put then Erie next, or Medina next, or Cuyahoga next, just based on, on the, the, the ranking, and then have the rest of them maybe in alphabetic order. A drop down always has a value. So if you want to make a default, make it the top one on the list. So in this case, I would make Lorraine the top one on the list if I wanted that. Um, I guess there's other ways to do it as well, but typically that would be the way I would do it. You have to decide if it makes sense to have a, a, a default or if you want to put like a dummy default that says like select county. The thing is, is you'd have to make sure that you would, if you did that, you'd have to write some JavaScript validation to make sure they didn't leave it at that. The danger with a default is that people aren't going to change it. All right. So if I were to say, um, let's say I were to pick for, you know, I I instead of doing um, Lorain County Community College, I would do Ohio State. Let's say I'm doing a website for Ohio State. There, a default county would probably be, be not quite as feasible, right? Because people come from all over the state to go to Ohio State, all right? So therefore, if I were to have a drop down and I defaulted to a certain county, you'd run the risk of someone being sloppy and not completing the form correctly and just staying with the default, all right, and having erroneous data that way. Um, the problem of not choosing a, a, a drop down or not choosing a default for a drop down or other field is that you run the risk, uh, or you don't run the risk, but you, you uh, annoy people by picking something where 90% of them were going to pick that anyhow. So, in other words, if I default for Lorraine Community College a drop down to Lorraine County, then, you know, I'm saving most of the people a little bit of time, <laughs> all right, in completing the form, all right. But you run the risk of someone not looking at the form carefully enough and giving the wrong answer. So you have to sort of weigh those two possibilities against each other. So the drop down is one. Other things are radio buttons. Radio buttons are like the old radio buttons in cars, whereas only one of them can be active at a time. So if I select Lorain County and I then select Cuyahoga County, it automatically unchecks Lorain County. Why would I do this? Again, if I wanted to limit the number of possibilities. If it, you know, you can't just make up the name of a county that you live in, all right, and put it in a text box. I could put it in a text box, but then I'd have run the risk of people, you know, not, not typing it in correctly or abbreviating or whatever. But with this, I can give a list of choices and let the user select one. Again, I can um, set a default if I want to, and we'll look at that. 
And but to va if I don't set a default to validate it, I'm going to have to write some JavaScript code. Are the drop are drop downs and radio buttons more or less used for the same sort of thing? Is that a true statement? If I were to say that drop downs and radio buttons are more or less used for the same thing, yeah, more or less. If you discount the fact that drop downs can be configured to allow multiple selections where radio buttons can't, both of these give you a list of options where you can pick one and only one. To really validate it, you're going to have to use JavaScript though. When would you use a drop down as opposed to a radio button? Yeah, probably real estate. In other words, there are, how many counties are there in Ohio? 80 some, I think. Yeah, I think it's in the 80s. If I were to have radio buttons for that, that would take up a lot of physical space on the screen. All right. If um, I was, you know, if I had a, 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 uh, a checkbox for, or I'm sorry, not a checkbox, but if I had a radio button for, you know, pick your level of education, you know, high school graduate, college graduate, um, postgraduate degree. There's only three options there. That one could go either way. The advantage of the radio button is, is all the options are shown all the time. You can always see those, whereas with a drop down you actually have to click on the arrow to see that. But yeah, beyond that it's largely a real estate issue. You had a question? Uh, what, what? You have a set of Oh, that's a good, right, right. So, so in other words, like with county, maybe you pick a state first, and then the state determine a region, and then, yeah. Uh, that is a good question. I am not sure. I think that would be done via JavaScript, even under HTML5, but I cannot say that to be sure. All right. Checkboxes are the next things on the list. What degree programs are you interested in? Well, what's the difference between a checkbox and a radio button? Yeah, multiple, e each checkbox, consider it to be a yes or no question. All right. So I could be potentially interested in several degree programs, so each one of them. Now if you think about it, if I was going to put degree programs that you are interested in, I could actually use all three of these, right? Are you interested in CISS? And have a drop down for yes and no. Are you interested in accounting? Have a drop down for yes and no. All right. I could have radio buttons. Are you interested in CISS? Yes and no. Are you interested in accounting? Yes, no. Or I could say select what you're interested in. CISS, accounting. I think in this particular case the last one is the logical option to, to pick. The other ones are not incorrect, but yeah, I think, they're a little, I, I think this is a little more straightforward and simple to do that. Now, there may be other occasions, though. Like, for example, you know, we've all seen, like, like uh, in doctor's offices, like a thing that will say, like, you have to fill out um, a questionnaire that says, have you had surgery in the past 12 months? Have you had... Um, you know, have you had, does, is there a history of heart disease in your family? Is there a history of diabetes in your family? And all those. Now for those, it almost makes sense to make it a yes, no radio button because you really want to stop and like think about those. It's almost like a, a, a multiple choice question on a, on a test. All right. Uh, so again, your job is to look at these form controls and say what's going to make most sense for the particular form that I'm devising. All right, what's the easiest way? How am I going to, how do I think about this? All right. There are 
couple other form controls that we'll look at and then we'll actually get into them. There's a password which does not echo the keystrokes. There is a text area which is multiple line. There is a reset button which you should almost never use because that blanks out the form. Why do I say never, almost never use a reset button? Yeah. That's true. That's a true statement that, that it's very rare that you're going to be entering a form and I'm typing in Mike Zeller's, you know, um, office uh, BU211J, uh, then, oh, wait a minute, no, I'm, I'm actually Don Huffman. I better uh, eliminate all this and, and clear that. It's probably not going to happen. If anything, you'll notice, oh, wait a minute, I typoed on my office, so let me go and type that in, correct? Really the number of form itself whenever there's an error. So yeah. What, uh, but having a submit button, is there another reason not to like them? Let's see if I can find this or if they even corrected it. Let's go and let's search for classes. <laughs> Good. I always hate when people, when they, when, when they correct my bad examples. Not LC per se, but, but any of the websites. Okay. Oh, where did that go? Oh, here it is. All right, let's say I'm searching. Wow. Let's see. I want to take a CISS course. And I want to make sure that Zellers is teaching it. I love this. This is such an optimistic form because there's a way to ask for an instructor, but there's no way to exclude an instructor. So if you want to take any CISS class that ain't taught by Zellers, tough luck. You can't use this tool. All right. So OK, I put all my criteria in, and I painstakingly think through all this. And I think of what days of the week. I can only do it on these days. And I think that, uh, and I go to do it. And, oh, let me click on the bigger button. Boom, clear criteria. And it clears it. That's the problem with reset buttons, is that they make you think. And they muddy the water. All right? And it's true that maybe there's occasion to clear this and start over. But I'm thinking this does more harm than good because people are more likely to click it, given the fact that that's the first button on the list and given the fact that physically it's the biggest button on the, on, on the list of buttons. People are liable to click it. So I would say very rarely use those buttons. There's a, actually an article in the resources section that, that, uh, that talks about this in more detail. So I never use them. So. I bring, them up, I bring them up to tell you not to use them, <laughs> all right? There's another kind of button that's just a plain old button. That's job is to invoke JavaScript, all right? If you remember, we have a submit button that you click on to send your data to the server and let the server do its thing, all right? There's another kind of button, though, as, as we talked out and in, in the, the questions, um, got some questions today. People ask, like, do you got to send data to the server? Is there something that maybe is only just going to be on my page or something like that? And yeah, you can also use forms to invoke JavaScript. And a plain old button allows you to wire a chunk of JavaScript code to that button. So we're not going to talk about this now until we talk about JavaScript later on. So this one temporarily is off our list. I think that's everything. All right, let's look at, yes, go ahead. Well, I mean, you're in coverage, you know, if you're filling out a form and you forget something and it says you've forgotten something. 
Mm-hmm. That's JavaScript. There are there is some facility in HTML5, but it's not necessarily widely um, supported across browsers. All right, so let's go and do this. And I'm going to go and I'm simply going to add to my form, even though that's not really relevant to this Bing search, but, you know, just so I don't create another. In fact, now oh, what the heck, I'll go and create another form. Let's say this was a registration form for... Let's say this is a registration form for the college or something. All right. I'm not going to, I don't actually have a server-side script to process this, so I'm just going to get rid of the action temporarily. We'll see what it does. I'll keep my submit button in there, and I'll keep my text box for name. All right. I'm then going to use a drop down for state. The drop down does not use a input tag. It uses a select tag. And associated with that select tag is a series of options. And each option will have a value and it will have text associated with it. I'm just going to do a couple states here. Now, we'll see the difference of these in a minute, but just as a preview, the thing between the start and end option tag, in other words, the full word, Ohio, Michigan, and Indiana, is what the user is going to see in a dropdown. The value is, in effect, what the script is going to see. All right? If you think about it, like let's say you're ordering a product. I might want to order, um, you know, a, a tripod for my camera. All right? So I'll look and I'll, I'll see the, 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 the product description. I want to order a, you know, such and such brand, tripod, blah, 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 blah. All right? Whoever I'm buying it from probably has some, like, item number associated with it or product number. And that's what they really need to order it, right? Because they're going to store it in a database with the item number and all that, saying you bought item number ABC123. But the users out there, me as a customer, I have no clue what item number ABC123 is. I know I want a such and such foot tri uh, tripod with blah, 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 blah. So in that drop down, the text would be something that a user would understand. like you know, a description of the product. Whereas the value would be like the item number. All right, something that behind the scenes is required. So let's go and look at this now, now that I've saved it. And we'll see. Now here we go, and there's our drop down. So notice the drop down shows the text and the um, 
behind the scenes, we're going to get the value. So select is specific drop down. Yes. Correct. Select. Correct. I didn't make it up. I believe you. I didn't there's a lot of things like that, you know. Uh, you're, you're selecting among a list of options, you know. Um, keep in mind that, that the folks that develop these standards are very much like theoretical folks. And, you know, they don't let their hands be sullied with things such as like how it's actually going to look in the screen. They're talking about conceptually what it is. And conceptually, a drop down is selecting among a list of options. Now, if I go and submit this, actually, if you don't specify an action, the form calls itself back. All right. Now, that might not be obvious why you do that, but there is a lot of cases where you do that when you do server-side scripting. And notice now, if I click Go, oops, I forgot to put a name on that guy. Actually, I should probably put a name on all my form elements. Now you notice you see name equals nothing. I'll put something in. State equals OH, not Ohio, but OH, the value. And the submit button equals go. All right. If you give something a name, it gets sent to the server. Now, you give submit buttons names so that the server knows which action to take. For example, in Google, I'm feeling lucky versus search. That's one form that has two buttons, but the server is going to do something different depending on which button is pressed. So therefore, the server will look to see which button is pressed and then take the appropriate action. You could have something similar to that uh, on an online order form where you have a button to, that says change your order and then another button that says delete your order. All right. Both of them might call the same script, but then the script looks to see which button is pressed and then takes the appropriate action on that. All right. Notice I did not put a um, dummy value, so the first value is what gets selected. I could actually, I actually could arrange these in, in alphabetical order and then just put the selected attribute on Ohio. And that would work too. All right, that would make that the default. Normally I put it at the top because I'm also going to put the next common ones underneath it. Like, so for example, if I was doing something related to Ohio, I would assume that if Ohio is the top choice, that the states surrounding Ohio are the next choices, like Michigan, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, West Virginia, and so on. So I would put those near the top, as opposed to putting them in alphabetical order and selecting them. That way, it's easy to scroll through. All right. That is the drop down. Radio buttons. This is done with a input tag or a series of input tags. Type equals radio. Name equals county, let's say. I know that this this Form won't necessarily make sense, but, you know, we'll, we'll do it anyhow. Value equals Lorraine. Now, if I do this,
I get these radio buttons, but I don't know which is which. All right. So with the radio button, I'm going to have to label this. In fact, even with that text box, I probably should label that because otherwise, you know, it's not necessarily obvious what it is. For accessibility reasons, I, I could do just this. I could say name. And I could say Lorraine. Cuyahoga. Erie. All right. All right. Now, that would work for someone that can see, someone that isn't visually impaired, all right? If we're in this text box, if, if I go and, let's say, I hit the tab button a bunch of times, and boom, I end up in that text box. What field am I in? Oh, I'm in, well, what's the label next to it? Name. So I know I'm in the name text box. We do that without even thinking. We see that, that what the label is adjacent to it, that's the label that must belong to that form element. People that can't see can't do that. They can't see what is adjacent to it. Therefore, you need to tie a label to a form control. All right? And you do that pretty simply, and we'll take a look at that. Now, this is a case of something we're going to do for accessibility. But there's sort of some nice styling implications of this too. And we'll get into this um, in a minute. The other point that I want to raise is that this form is starting to look kind of ugly. All right? Typically, yeah, it's going across and generally you don't want to, you know, eventually we're going to like scroll off the end of that. So typically a form is a single column could be multiple columns, but generally it's a single column where you have label, value, label, value, label, value. In other words, it's a list of form controls, all right, is, is really what a form is, a list of fields to be filled in. So with that in mind, I'm going to go and I'm going to put my form in an unordered list. And each form item, I'm going to make a list item. So name's a list item. State is a list item. County is a list item. And then finally my submit button is a list item. I mean, that's a good conceptual way to define a form. It's a list of items that we're going to send to the server. So now it looks like this. All right. We could still probably do better appearance-wise, but we're moving in the right direction. For example, we probably don't want those uh, bullet points. 
Number two, we probably want some nice margins lining up. All right? And we'll start on this today, and either we'll finish today or we'll finish next time. All right, so how do I get rid of the bullet points in my CSS? I can define for ULs list style type none. All right, got rid of those. Starting to look better already. I talked about the label tag, which we haven't implemented yet. Well, The label tag has a for attribute where we specify the ID of the thing that this is a label for. So I say label for text name. I have to say ID equals text name. Now, one thing that is a, is a common issue is confusion between the name and the ID. The name and the ID are created and they do different things. They're really not redundant because a radio button, for a radio button to work, they all need to have the same name. That's what tells the browser, hey, this is a group of radio button items. Treat them as a unit. All right. The ID, though, is going to be different for each radio button. All right, why? Because ID has to be unique, period. It has to point to one thing. So they may, it may on the surface look redundant that there's two things. Really, there's, there's a good, good reason why there's two things. So I can go label for DD state and label. ID equals DD state. I would then do a similar thing for each of the radio buttons. I'll do the first one here. Label for RB Lorraine. D equals R B Lorraine. Now, if we view this, we'll notice that visibly nothing has changed. All right? We've just conceptually linked those form elements to their respective labels so the screen reader can uh, screen reader can do that. But watch for my last trick of today. All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make this form a lot prettier because I now have label tags and form tags as part of this list item. What if I do something like this? Label with 50 pixels, for example. Text align right.
typically what I do when I'm doing this is I'll do something like this to give it some goofy color so I can see it. All right, that part works. That's good. All right, that is not working. My thought would be that display Inline block is sort of a cross between inline and block. There we go. I must have had a typo before. Let's make that 100 pixels to make it more obvious. All right. Now I can say text align right. And now I have a neat form, whereas that is, the, the, the form labels are right next to the form elements, and there's a nice margin sort of in the middle. The submit button's sort of sticking out, but we could, we could figure out something to do with that. All right. Um, I know I kind of went through the last couple of things a little fast, so we'll reiterate those on Tuesday. In addition, we have a handful of more form elements to do, and then a few, uh, a few other things that we can put in for accessibility and also for sort of aesthetic uh, reasons, for styling reasons. So that's where we'll pick up on uh, Monday to finish this off. Pardon me? Tuesday, I guess. If you don't want to put the extra effort to come in on Monday to learn this, that's fine. We'll do it on Tuesday. All right. See you over in lab.